and I've I've put the link I've put the link for e transfers into the chat now for those who want. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, but now I need uh, it says host disabled participant screen. So if you could make uh, me yeah, host, yeah 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 I forgot about that part. Sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll get it right yet. That's probably a reason why you couldn't leave without closing the meeting. But we'll see. Maybe. maybe. Um, Remember where that is? Yeah, I, I got it. I just have to hit the right button. I haven't had enough coffee yet. This is, uh, he's like in the console of the Starship Enterprise there in his office. <laughs> okay. Yeah, are, you, are, you, are you on? I'm set to go, yeah. Awesome. And hopefully everyone can see that okay. So I've really got to watch my time because I've got, of course, too much content. And uh, but that's okay. That's no problem. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, you know, the theme for this weekend is a cross-shaped journey. And what we're doing there is talking about suffering. We're talking about grieving. We'll be talking about death in the next session. Um, uh, oh, yesterday, we talked about the life of the Beatitudes. And um, oh, somebody needs to mute. There we go. And uh, uh, so for this session, I want to talk about this word affliction and and then alongside that, the word co-suffering. So I was listening to the Vespers uh, prayers from last night, this morning, just on a podcast, and I heard these words. I have de declared my affliction before thee. And so, um, you know, two of the greatest influences on my life uh are Simone Weil, especially in her cruciform or cross-shaped approach to affliction, and then Fyodor Dostoevsky, and how co-suffering love is a theme that we'll see throughout his work. So I want to touch on those a bit and how they bring us into kind of uh, the unity or of our of our suffering with Christ and vice versa. So. Um, these are some quotes from her on affliction. In the realm of suffering, affliction is a thing apart, specific, irreducible. It is wholly different than simple suffering. I want to cooperate with you. I want to say something. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> there we go. He was... Uh, um, in the, so that uh, this, it is wholly different than simple suffering. Affliction grips the soul and marks it to the depths with a mark belonging only to itself, the mark of slavery. So what we have here is uh, Simone Weil does regard a broader sense of suffering, um, that suffering is simply uh, being subject to. Um, we suffer challenges. We suffer setbacks. We suffer dilemmas and all of this. But for her, affliction is a technical word where there is no redemption in this life or there's no fix. So it would be like um, a grand, I'm thinking of actual cases that I know of. Uh, affliction would be grandparents who have their grandchild over and are minding it and it drowns in the hot tub. That's affliction. Um, it is uh, sexual assault. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I... Um, it's sexual assault that, that results in a murder. You know, there's no lesson to be learned there. Um, this is this is just affliction, and he she would say that about about slavery and so on. So the question is this: um, Do we do we ever? I'm very sorry about the slides. There, um, do we ever experience affliction in a way that we can say God caused this to me and and she would say no affliction is is like the crucifixion and yet can we find God in that so th this really troubled her because she uh, she says I feel an ever increasing sense of devastation ceaselessly and increasingly torn both in my intellect and in the center of my heart at my inability to think with truth at the same time about the affliction of man, the perfection or goodness of God, and the link between the two. So she's trying to hold together a premise. God is good, period. Um, God's goodness is not contingent on how well I'm doing, how happy I am. Yeah, in, in, in here, I want to... 
Father Leonard, can you take care of the muting for me? <clears throat> um, and she, she's having trouble holding the two together. The goodness I of God and the, and the point here. Um, and she says, I must move toward an abiding conception of the divine mercy, a conception which does not change whatever event destiny may send upon me and which can be communicated to no matter what human being. And so um, now in English, <laughs> um, she's saying, I believe in the goodness of God, but before my eyes, during especially, she's a Jew during the, the Hitler's occupation of France. She knows about the oppression. And so she's like, how do you hold these two together? How do you hold the goodness of God, the affliction of humanity together? And then she, she says, the distance between the two is a real contradiction. And here's the problem. We always try to harmonize them. And the way we try to harmonize them is by, you know, let's say, um, she, she will say, a theology of glory that means it doesn't mean gl glory in the sense we think but a theology of glory is rationalizing affliction in order to make the and, and she said if you do that you will always always call good evil or evil good in other words you'll make god the agent of affliction where he's the primary cause of it or you will turn the affliction something actually evil into a goodness so like well you know god was teaching you a lesson what my my grandchild drowned what's the, what kind of god would teach you a lesson he's a terrible teacher then or i will see this in churches where people are singing about god is in control and I'm, i know who's people in the room who were molested as children and if god is in control in that sense if he was the cause and agent of their affliction then he must be evil and so she's struggling to hold the two together. And she, she finally says, you can't, but here's what you can do. That the two, the goodness of God, the affliction of man, function like pinchers. That if you can just, that, that, and they grab you and they arrest you and they throw you down into the abyss. And this is, of course, this happens to Nietzsche. But when he's in the abyss, he sees just darkness and nihilism <clears> because <throat> he, had a, he had renounced love. But because Simone Weil won't renounce love, when she's thrown down by this contradiction into the abyss, she finds herself looking up at the cross. And she says that infinite distance between affliction and goodness, it is spanned by the cross. And the whole history of the human race, the whole timeline from the first time somebody was assaulted or murdered, you know, we could say literally in history or in our story, Cain killing Abel. From that moment all the way to this moment, um, that timeline is between the two hands of Christ, his wounds on the cross. And that, that timeline of human history is all within his span on the cross and it passes through his very heart. And then she said, and then your, your affliction, the unresolved things and pains and the things where you see no redemption in this lifetime, it functions like the affliction it hammers you like a nail into the very heart of Christ. And so your union with him comes its closest actually in your affliction without it being resolved. But she says, as we look up then at the cross, this kind of we are arrested by affliction in a way that causes us to gaze on the one hanging there. And there in him, this person, we see perfect goodness and absolute affliction. And they intersect in that one. And from his wounds flow healing into the world. Well, this is a mystical experience then. This isn't about explaining away, you know, suffering or affliction. It is not about rationalizing. It is saying my affliction <clears throat> me into a contemplative beholding of the one who, where, inter where goodness and affliction inter um, intersected. And, and it's, it's not a theodicy, which it's an anti-theodicy of the cross really. Um, so, 
so that's a bit about her on affliction, this technical word for suffering that's not redeemed in this world, and yet we meet Christ in it, and we are united with Christ in it, and we find there that, that Christ co-suffers our affliction in us and in him, and um, she, so for me, when, I, when my life was really falling apart, uh, one of the times, <laughs> um, this was my experience. And I was in despair and I looked up and, and the words of Simone Veil came to me. She said, be astonished. Be astonished by a perfect goodness revealed as the love flowing from that one on the cross. Be astonished by the depths of human affliction. It's just astonishing what people suffer. And it is astonishing to find that suffering in the goodness of God as he, as he pours out healing love from his wounds into ours and then from ours into the world. So some of you here have suffered affliction and instead of turning away from Christ, you, you have bled that affliction into the world as co-suffering love that heals people. And that's where we want to shift to Dostoevsky now. So Dostoevsky also experienced uh, affliction and he writes a lot about it, um, probably more powerfully than anyone in terms of narratives. And he doesn't use the phrase co-suffering love, but Archbishop Lazar, he, he, he says that co-suffering love, it, this, is the, this is the theme of Dostoevsky's works. So I want to give you just a couple examples. So, um, and by the way, you know, uh, true credit to Archbishop Lazar, we'll, we'll see later where he got the phrase from, but... Um, if you hear that phrase anywhere in North America now, probably the person has been reading him, you know, and we've internalized it over time so that I would even say the gospel is that God is good and that that goodness is revealed in the love of Jesus Christ. And, and it comes into greatest focus on the cross where we see God is um, self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. That's the nature of God. That is the cruciform. And it's the cruciform in Christ, but it's also the cruciform in his disciples. Self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. But this co-suffering language uh, I learned from Vladika. So two examples. There's so many in Dostoevsky. We have time for two. One is in the prayers of Staritz Zosima. He's an elder monk in the novel Brothers Karamazov. And in his prayers, um, he thinks about co-suffering love in terms of I am bearing the sins of all humanity to Christ. Uh, for those who cannot confess, for those who cannot even see their sin, for those who who suffer the insanity of guilt and like and, and their their consciences are tormenting them. They live in fevers and in tears. He brings them and all of humanity with him. Um, in his, in his prayer cell to the Lord, he says to one of his disciples, do not say sin is strong and we are lonely and powerless. There is one salvation for you. Take yourself up and make yourself responsible for all the sins of men. For indeed, it is so, my friend. And the moment you make yourself sincerely responsible for everything and everyone, you will see at once that it really is so, that it is you who are guilty on behalf of all and for all. I'm like, oh my goodness. I can I could imagine this being pathological very easily. Uh, I can see those who live this way in codependency. And and but Elder Zosima, he, he's saying, no, you know, you can come before the Lord and say, we are guilty. I will identify with the sins of humanity. So someone like Daniel or Jeremiah in the Old Testament would confess, we have sinned on behalf of their nation without direct complicity. And so instead of, let's say as a white privileged person, male in this world, instead of finding ways to absolve myself from complicity, I can, I can say, oh no, as a white male, we have sinned. As a Canadian uh, settler, well, I never did this. Yes, we did. And though I may not see my own direct complicity, I can step into that responsibility through confession. 
And I can, I can do, um, we could call it identificational repentance. I identify with the sins of my people and I repent as um, on behalf of the collective. This is what Christ does himself in the Jordan River. When he takes John's baptism of repentance without having anything to repent of, except he does the sins of the whole world. And he's able to do identificational repentance on behalf of all and for all. And so I think that's where Elder Zosima is coming from. And he does this again and again. And he just is not, he's never justifying himself as set apart in some self-righteous way uh, from those who he looks around and we might be tempted to judge. And what we need to do is see ourselves as united with each human being in our common humanity and, and this wonderful capacity then to come before the Lord and, and, and on behalf of the other. Now that's, you know, you've got a lot of teachings and prayers like this from Start Zosima and Brothers Karamazov, but you see the whole thing beautifully in Crime and Punishment and uh, the saving tears of Sonia. So this isn't about words. She's able to practice co-suffering love on behalf of, of the other through her tears and especially uh so just spoiler alert uh, crime and punishment is a, they're both murder mysteries actually um uh in the case of crime and punishment we know who the murderer is and he thinks he has risen above good and evil and he's going to prove it to himself by murdering somebody and it all goes awry throughout the book then Instead of being able to rise above it, his conscience begins to torment him. Uh, this is our judge, the conscience, according to Vladika. I, I, I buy this. Um, and unfortunately, Raskolnikov just cannot own his own sin, his own crime. And so, but he's resisting his conscience and he goes into delirium. He goes into sickness. He goes into fevers repeatedly. And it's, he's trying to run. Um, and he's hardening his heart to what he's done. And then this young underage sex worker who, who sells herself in order to feed her younger siblings because her father has drank away um, all they own. Um, she's forced into, into the sex trade. Uh, and she has this tender heart. And she encounters the murderer, Raskolnikov, and... She sees that he can't weep for his own sins and she weeps for him. And now here's the wild thing. Nothing else could bring him to confession. Nothing else could bring him to repentance. Nothing else could bring him to his knees, but that his heart is softened by her tears. He is saved by her co-suffering love revealed in the tears rolling down her cheeks. It actually has the power to transform him. And maybe... That's the only power we have to participate in somebody else's salvation is, you know, all of my advice, the input I give, okay, maybe somehow that's a little bit helpful, but what brings transformation is, is co-suffering love. And so um, I, I promised to tell you where, where did Vladika get this phrase, co-suffering love. He sees it everywhere in Dostoevsky, but, but Dostoevsky doesn't use the phrase. Well, it is from St. Antony Kropovitsky, uh, Kropovitsky, and uh, from Russia. And, and, and this is really a, a spiritual father for Vladika. And then I guess this would make me a spiritual grandson. He says these things, Christ suffered more greatly from his moral grief for humanity than he suffered physically on the cross. And he's thinking here specifically of in the Garden of Gethsemane, the tears and the sweat and the prayers of Christ are not because he's worried about dying on a cross. Many martyrs have died horrible deaths singing and at peace, but Christ is here agonizing. Why? It's because uh, it's not for fear of what he's about to experience, but it's he already begins now to bear the sins of all humanity it, within the limitations of a human body. And, and he feels the weight of that. So uh, Kropovitsky says it this way, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord demonstrated the ultimate degree of co-suffering with the sins of every person 
when he began to be oppressed by them to such a degree that he asked the heavenly father to deliver him from the agony. And Hebrews says, and he was heard because of his reverence as an angel appeared and strengthened him. He goes on, how can I benefit from the savior's grief over people's sin in the way that a corrupted person's soul is filled by a person's co-suffering love, a friend's co-suffering love. So what he's trying to do here is he's trying to say, okay, Christ was grieving the sins of the world, my sins, the sins I've undergone and been wounded by, the sins I've inflicted and wounded others with. How do we put Christ's grief in Gethsemane alongside a friend's grief for me as they co-suffer through my experience. And how does that love then fill me and transform me? He says, only if I am convinced of the certainty that I too, I personally, as an individual, was and am encompassed in the heart of Christ, who grieves over my sins. Only when I'm aware that he beholds me, stretches out his supporting hand toward me, encompasses me with his co-suffering love. Only then is he my savior, pouring new moral strength into me. Um, you know, this is John 17. I am in you, you are in me. And, and it's this outpouring of love in the context of affliction. And then he says, this is possible only when he is not foreign to me, not a historical example of virtue, but part of my being, or more correctly, when I am part of his being, a participant of the divine nature. So the whole thing around co-suffering love is premised on my union with Christ and Christ's union with me. In that union, uh, uh Christ's co-suffering love for me from Gethsemane and the cross can heal my heart. From that place, I can minister co-suffering love to another. And it, in fact, it's Christ continuing his work in me. And this is, this is the Apostle Paul then. You know, the, that's really where we're rooting all of this. Uh, they, Dostoevsky, Kropovitsky, Paul, he says this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became minister according to the divine office, which was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now made manifest to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, that, this verse re really used to bother me because Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. Um, and then this to me sounded like I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. There's that word affliction again. I make it complete. What do you mean there's something lacking in Christ's afflictions? And so uh, David Stark explains really well, I think. He, he resolved it for me in, a, in something he wrote on co-suffering love. He said, Paul's point is not that Christ's work is incomplete, but that it continues. And he has not left his people to do these things alone. That is to suffer affliction. As he says in the Gospel of John, the mystery of perfection is one of mutual indwelling, I and you, you and me, in which the image of the Holy Trinity is realized in humanity. Our unity of being and manyness of persons are realized in love through God entering our nature. So um, when it says, when he says uh, that the work of Christ, it's not that it was incomplete or not enough. It's just that Christ continues his work in us so that when Paul is persecuting the church, Jesus Christ can say to him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That is, he is so identified with our afflictions that our afflictions are his afflictions in an ongoing way. That that um, And Father John Bear goes down this road too. It, it's that that the union is so complete that it is not just 
that Jesus has suffered something like we did with, by analogy, you know? So you, it's not just that you think back, okay, was there a time during his 33 year sojourn on earth here where he actually experienced what it's like to lose a baby? No. Uh, to grow old and alone and forgotten in a senior's complex? No. Did he ever suffer a series of strokes or, you know, uh, have to have a catheter? No. And so, but well, but but it may be, you know, and you look for analogies. No, no, no. He's what Paul is saying is he absolutely has suffered the loneliness of a widow directly in every widow in whom he is completely united. He has suffered a miscarriage in every woman who's ever lost a baby in all of history. And this begins to come upon him in Gethsemane already. But I'm saying in the now, he continues the ministry of co-suffering love, experiencing directly uh, our experience as us. Why, why are you persecuting me? Uh, those who've been martyred, those who've been beaten, every bullet, every piece of shrapnel from every war, he's drawn it up into himself and swallows it in love and recycles it into radical forgiveness and, 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 and self-giving love into the world through his wounds and through our wounds. Uh, one more note here. The glory with which thou hast given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I and them, thou and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me, love them even as thou hast loved me. Now here... I mean, so he's, the glory that the Father gave him, he's given us. Here's the problem. The glory is that he was elevated to a cross. Um, in John 17, now, now I've glorified you, now glorify me. And he's glorified by his ascent onto the cross. And he shares that glory with us. What is it, that we would be crucified? No, that we would enter the ministry of co-suffering love through the other and be able to empathize. That's think of these words. Calm passion means passion is in suffering. Calm with calm passion, sim pathos, m pathos. It's about it's about our union in our sufferings in a way that brings comfort and relief, even where we would see no no resurrection until until the age to come um now all of that all of that is fine on a screen in a theology book from a prof you know um i do experience this but i think what i would love to do is now introduce you to my dear friend father leonard who is an incredible practitioner of this and he's going to share um uh, his perspective on us, but I, I, I'm saying that the, that the Lord has called him to the ministry of Paul in this, and he does it all the time in his trauma work. And so I'll stop sharing and pass the baton to Father Leonard. Well, you are incredibly kind. Um, I have to be careful uh, whenever Brad starts saying things like that, because I need to check in with my wife to make sure I don't have, my ego isn't growing too far. And if that doesn't work, I'll talk to my deacon because he's really good at this as well. So that being said, and, and just put that aside, um, thank you so much. And, and, and I'm, I'm truly blessed. I particularly love Simone Weil. I'm, I'm reading her more and more and just, um, she is just so profound. Enough of that stuff. Okay, now, where, I'm going to find out how I can get, there we go, okay. Um, Go up to where?
the cross is um I, I'm so blessed with um Father Tom Hopkins <clears throat> um, discussion and his teaching <clears throat> that I keep going back there and this this is particularly particularly good stuff. And uh, it seems like he's really we're all in line with this in a, in a beautiful way. One of the things that I think is important to note is that um, healing from suffering is strongly linked to forgiveness of sins and, and very much linked to our salvation. And that's sort of what the cross is all about. The cross is a place where God died to defeat death. Trampling down death by death. And it just it just makes so much sense. And as we get into that idea more thoroughly, we'll understand that uh, that that's exactly where we need to go. And that's exactly what what is talking about. And it's hard work and all of those other kind of good things. So. Uh, OK. Where is God in our, in our suffering? Where, where is God when, um, I think Father Tom sort of made this bad joke that uh, he sort of looked at uh, some, some, uh, someone in his parish, I think that, oh, you know, I, I pray, he was complaining, not lamenting, but complaining and uh, saying, well, you know, I, I do all these good things. I'm such a wonderful person. And yet I went skiing and I broke my leg. Where was God? Well, God was right there in your broken leg. And he is inside of you as you were going towards healing. But we have to understand that that's where God is. God is healing us from within. Uh, he points out, all, Father Tom points out, that there's nowhere, in, 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 especially in the Gospels, that says, um, I exist so that people would not get cancer and die, or I exist so that babies won't be born retarded or crippled. And that's just, that's the reality. This is, this is who we are in life. And God loves us thoroughly. And as, as uh, Brad Point, you know, illustrated with Simone Biles' help, this is truly exactly where we all need to go. This is this is the, uh, the, uh, the you know this this is it, folks. He used uh, Mother Teresa as uh, as another kind of a, a valiant crusader for for God's love, and he talks about this interview that he he noticed that she was on on, on television. And as I, I'll kind of go along and read this on, on the screen, but you'll get the idea fairly quickly. Um, I don't think we should work to restructure society and everything so there would be less death and on. And so she kind of didn't know what this uh, interviewee interviewer was talking about. Oh, you're dying. They're dying. And my Lord died. And when they die, they're with him. And I have to be with them, for it is Jesus, for I do it for Jesus. So the interviewer was getting a little kind of agitated, and she said, okay, 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 but look how many dead people there are. Look how many suffering people there are. You can only help a handful of them, you see. And anyway, you're not very successful, you know. I mean... Don't you wish that you were more successful? Could you do more? And Mother Teresa replied, oh yes, we cannot help everyone, but each one of them is Christ, and each one of them is a life, and if we could just do that, we'd do it. And then she said, without being successful, she said, my Lord never commanded his people to be successful. He commanded them to be faithful, not successful. If they're success, that's his business. I don't know how many people are going to die. All I know is that I have my life, and these are the dying people, and I will help them. I will be with them. And the journalist thought, 
and she was coming to a knockout punch. And uh, his, Father Tom has a beautiful way of saying this. Really being agitated at this point, she said, okay, you could even feel maybe, and he said, my paranoia, but I felt a kind of nasty streak in her voice. And she said, but you are helping all those suffering people who are dying in the streets and dying, and you're not suffering. You're not dying. You have food to eat. You're healthy. How come your God does that? See, it's not just. Look at you. And Mother Teresa said, yes, it is not just. But God takes this injustice upon himself. He came and he died with everyone who died. And there will be a kingdom where there is no sickness, no sorrow, no dying, no injustice, but life everlasting. And that's what I believe. And therefore, I believe that any suffering connected to his suffering has a value for the recreation, for the recreation of the world when we do it without yielding to evil. Then the woman said, yes, but you don't suffer. And Mother Teresa said, yes, because I am not worthy. I am not worthy to suffer with my Lord. At least I can be with those who are. That is just such a profound statement. Every time I read it or every time I hear it, I, I'm in tears. It just, it just, it just reeks of uh, co-suffering is the words we're using today. So what comes with that then is that we have to take responsibility for our lives. Mother Teresa wasn't suffering. She wasn't sick. She didn't have leprosy. But she was called to be with those who were suffering, to share in their pain, to co-suffer with them as much as God allowed her. And this is our job, to be with those who are in pain. I once <clears throat> worked at a place where uh, um, people worked with uh, eating disorders. And uh, on, on there's a little sign that says, there is no greater gift that you can give than to be with someone in their pain. There's no greater gift than to sit silently with people in their pain. And you feel that pain. Every, when I work with folks, especially as a therapist, I realize part of the hard work is actually being touched by the pain of those that I'm working with. It is such a blessing and it's so scary and it's so all kinds of things. It's hard. It's hard. We feel that pain that these people are enduring. But as we do that, we allow God's love to flow through us. And that's what we do when we sit with those folks in their pain and just let it be absorbed, let it kind of go through us to them. It is God's love that is flowing. It is how we become God's servants, to become God's students. As Vedika Lazar mentioned yesterday, his greatest teachers are those he works with in the 12 step programs. And I can certainly um, connect with that. I learn more from my clients than I ever learned from anywhere else. And certainly I learn more from them than they learn from me. That, that is an absolute certainty. So that's where we need to go. How can we find a way to be responsible? How can we take on the role of the one who is, okay, I am a terrible person. Yeah, okay, you can say that out loud. But what does it mean? What does it mean that you are a terrible person? You're sinful, all that kind of stuff is absolutely true. But we need to own that. We need to own all the afflictions that are within us. 
including those things that were put upon us. An example that Father Tom talked about and that I certainly have worked with many, many times in clients is the pain of abuse. People don't ask for abuse, especially as little children, but it happens. Sometimes by their parents, sometimes by other ones who have connection, sometimes by you know strangers, but not as often as, as close family members. And it's not fair. That's another place where there is no justice. But in order to heal from that trauma, the person must take responsibility for what that trauma is doing within them and ask God to heal them. It's an asking and a recognition. Yep, that's mine. Now, God, what do I do? And oftentimes it requires help from someone who has some expertise in that area or to find a friend who can just sit with them as they're reconnecting with their trauma, as they're being re-traumatized, as the PTSD bites them again and again. If there's someone who can sit with them, it makes a huge difference, major difference. A question that I often ask is, what is your support? Who are you able to go to when things get really bad for you? And that, that is something that is critically important for those who are suffering. To have someone to be with them, to help them, to conf I mean, as a priest, we, I hear a confession. And that, that's another important part of, of having, of, of being, you know, access to a priest who can say, who can hear all the yuck that's going on, and then hear God's words that say, you are forgiven, just as David was forgiven when he confessed his sins, just as the prodigal was forgiven when he came back to the Father. All those illustrate the absolute, incredible, unconditional, perfect love that God has for us, that he will heal us totally in all of those things. So that's a big piece there, forgiven. Ah, <clears throat> the other thing is when I first became Orthodox and started to learn about confession, which is kind of a strange concept for most of us who are not Orthodox or Roman Catholic, but it's sort of a something that uh, I always was in fear that, well, I'm just, you know, uh, becoming vulnerable to a priest who can manipulate me. And I'm sure that's what a lot of people have a fear of, and it, it's justified, it happens. But I was blessed to have a confessor who was pastoral and compassionate, who suffered with me as well, I know that. And after, I think one of the first times I, I experienced confession and received the prayer of absolution, um, Father Orest asked me, well, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, I'm not sure if I can accept God's forgiveness. I don't think I deserve it. It's just, it's just not there. I, I, I'm right. I don't deserve it. But Father Orest came up with a perfect response that I repeat many, many times in, in, in the parish. He said, to, he said to me with a very harsh look, he said, how dare you question God? How dare you not accept what he is giving to you? How dare you? Do you think you're better than God that you can reject his gift of forgiveness? That's hard. It's a very, very difficult thing to know that we are forgiven and to accept that forgiveness and to hear that prayer. The other thing that happens that we need to also be aware of is that not only do we have to take responsibility, we go for confession and we hear the absolution prayer. And 
since then it's it's always been very difficult to confess and it's very difficult to hear the words of forgiveness but every time that happens there's a bit of a lightness that comes about and it is something that um that is really pretty awesome but to hear that we are forgiven is is quite quite tricky father tom mentions that um like he said pretty much echoing what i heard from father orest like it or not you are forgiven proud people don't like to be forgiven in fact proud people would rather burn in hell and think they deserved it than to hear you're forgiven me forgiven for what but the forgiveness is there and more than the forgiveness is the identification the bearing of the burden of sin of the other without acting in an evil way in return this is what the word of the cross tells us this is the work that jesus did on the cross and the theme of our of our weekend is is sort of focused definitely around that the only way that you can redeem the other the only way that you can help to heal the other the only way that you can expiate the sin of the other is to take it upon yourself but not in a sick way not in um, not in the oh i'm suffering for the other way but rather in a way of sovereign freedom in total dignity in an absolutely voluntary act of love so that it is literally impossible that the evil will be victorious and mother teresa's example of that is a perfect way of, of stating that she is there with the people who are suffering she is not suffering because she claims to be not worthy of suffering the way these people are suffering you can't give it up and then one of the ways you don't give it an inch is not by denying it like well i'm a good person um i i've heard this lots and lots and i wonder okay what does a good person mean um i'm a good person because you know um, i don't go around killing people that's that's a good sign i don't go around you know um doing other bad things this is something that i find almost shocking especially when uh, in the people who kind of support this idea for themselves as those who are really doing some kind of awful stuff like supplying drugs to kids and that sort of thing but i won't go on that rent for the moment these are the folks who don't understand that yeah you have to take responsibility for who you are in the 12-step program the father uh, bishop lazar and and uh, brad lead an, an na program and all AA programs and all 12-step programs the first thing you need to do is that you have to own the fact that your life is out of control you have no control you are not able to fix anything only god can fix you and that's a tough one we can't do it ourselves all we can do is take ownership of the fact and then ask god to heal us that's where we go to a place of responsibility we don't blame others if if our parents have abused us or something else has happened or someone insulted us you know um we're feeling bad and we hurt but it's so important to remember that's our hurt that's our feeling bad that's my anger people can't make me angry I am angry. I am angry based upon um, something that happened to me, 
but nonetheless it's the emotion that God has given me and it's a very important emotion anger is the only way we can actually process something that is totally unfair to us so recognizing that that is our anger and God will heal us scripture says that we can be angry but don't sin and that that's a, can be a bit confusing for the moment but we don't sin because we take that anger and own it for ourselves. We ask God to heal us and to heal whoever it was that caused the hurt. We pray for our the people who hurt us. We pray for our enemies. We pray for everyone. And as uh, Brad was pointing out earlier, he was praying for the whole world that it might be saved. Yeah, this is what we do. Like it or not, we are forgiven. Here's another beautiful story from, from uh, Father Tom. And it talks a bit about, you know, do you want to be healed? In the case of the person who said, no, I'm a good person, I'm fine, or me, be forgiven for what? I, Father Tom speaks to this really, really, very eloquently was talking about an opportunity he had to preach a sermon somewhere near Chicago. And uh, he said um, something slipped into his sermon that he wasn't expecting. And he said, hoping that it's the Holy Spirit and not the devil or your own ego, I'm almost willing to say that this was of the Spirit because it was one of the Sundays after Holy Pascha where we have the 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 uh, gospel lesson of the man who was healed the paralytic who was healed was by the pool he was lying there for 38 years waiting for someone who could come to help him into the waters to be healed and jesus asked this really important question that seems kind of well silly as as uh, father tom goes on do you want to be healed. And in my sermon, I had no intention of saying this, it just slipped out. I said, on the spur of a moment, so to speak, in this big pulpit, in this big Greek church, you know, when you think of it, you're almost tempted to say, what a stupid question. You know, you're almost tempted to say, no, I'm lying here for a suntan. Or, you know, you are the Logos incarnate. You figure it out. Like putting it back. But the man said, yes, I want to be healed. And God healed him and forgave his sins and told him to carry on and don't sin again. That's what we do. We wait for as long as it takes. 38 years perhaps, or longer. Uh, I know in the work I've done with those who have been abused, um, one thing I've noticed, and, and this is men and women, mostly women, but, but men as well, that the earlier in age when the abuse happened, when the trauma took place, the earlier in years, the later in life it was possible for someone to begin the healing process. When, when someone is traumatized, abused, raped, you know, those kinds of things, in their late teens or early 20s, it's possible and perhaps even likely that they would be able to start their healing work by the time they're 30. Within a few years, they, can, they have enough life experience to know that, all right, this is what I'm dealing with. God help me. And they're able to kind of experience that help because it's still painful. They're still reliving the pain of the trauma. But the earlier in age, like a preschooler or an infant, for example, the later in life before you can actually even begin to start that work. I've had a couple of clients who were physically, sexually, emotionally abused at an extremely young age. And one in particular I remember, 
uh, who was an infant, I believe, couldn't begin the healing journey until she was in her 60s. And it takes longer. We worked together for maybe 20 years. Maybe not quite because she died somewhere in there. But she certainly experienced some healing work. It was hard work. And the agony she went through looking at her life and, and having the experience of dwelling in that pain and that burden was enormous. It just, that's what it is. Oftentimes, there isn't even a memory of the trauma. Sometimes, oftentimes, you do have the memory and you relive it with the help of someone who is with you, who is with the one burdened, who is with the one being healed by God. And it, that's a blessing. Um, sometimes I've been asked, especially dealing with marriages, why do you do that? It's such hard work. And I guess I've learned to say, yep, but as in that hard work, I know that it is God who is doing the healing work. And I give God the credit for that. But the advantage to me is that I get a front row seat to watching miracles happen. And that that is such truly a blessing. One of the things I think is important for us to remember is this little saying. There is no greater gift that you can give than to be with someone in their pain. There is nothing more that you can offer as Mother Teresa does, as when I at least can learn to be quiet and listen to people in the work I do, then yeah, if I can't, well, then I can get in the way. And it's really, really evident as time goes on that I'm getting in the way here. I need to shut up and listen. And that's sometimes hard for us. When we're with someone in their pain, we think we should be saying something. We think we should be doing something that is healing, that brings them contentment, that brings them, oh, happiness, I don't know. But the thing is, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can say. When people are grieving for a loved one who has died, there's a lot of words that come up and there's some really disastrous ones for example, oh, I know what you're feeling. That's simply a lie. It's just something that we, no, don't go there. That's, no, don't go there. You don't know. And even if my experience of losing someone who is close to me might be somewhat similar, I still do not know the pain of the other. We cannot read others' minds. Only God knows the reality of that pain. And it is God who heals as we give ourselves over to that healing, that healing kind of work and that healing structure. So um, that kind of sums up what I was hoping to share today. Um, do we have anyone who uh, has any questions? Where did Brad go? He ran away. Um, I had asked a little earlier in the chat <clears throat> if Brad might just elaborate a bit on why or on the notion of anti-theodicy. And and I, I do understand, you know, theodicy involves trying to recognize rec reconcile the problem of evil with with a good God. Um, in some ways, it strikes me that's that's exactly brilliantly what what your whole talk was about was that reconciliation. So I'm, I was just a little curious about anti anti-theodicy i guess yeah yeah so thanks la um so this does what what simone bay is doing with it is she is she is riffing off of um martin luther who had made this comment you know that a theology of glory says that um good is evil and evil is good but a theology of the cross says it is what it is <laughs> or that's how she translated it and and in other words let's just call evil evil let's call 
affliction, affliction. Let's call goodness, goodness. And and that, so Luther's worry and then Vey's was a theology of glory was about reasoning, reasoning your way into, um, a, let's say, a rational reconciliation and of, 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 of goodness and affliction. And she just... So she, when I say anti-theodicy, that's what she's against. That's what Luther's against. Now, it's not that there's no, it's not that there's no reconciliation, but the reconciliation is is in the person of Jesus Himself, and that that is you get there, you get there th by through uh, an experience of the cross, experience of beholding the good one suffering, and 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 acknowledging the real contradiction of it i think that's that's kind of where she's starting is like you guys you have to let it be a contradiction first and then the contradiction can only be held in a person not in a log what uh, a syllogism and so some would regard they uh, let, let's put it this way if you took my lecture about they <laughs> on its own that would just be another theodicy because i'm kind of i'm kind of reasoning something out um what ve is saying is, is that it's an anti-theodicy in the sense that it's a mystical experience and um uh, and it's a an experience that doesn't happen through the reasoning mind but it happens in your noose your innermost being in your heart um that with the eyes of your heart on the one on the one who is both good and and afflicted at the same time and then also that your the experience of your afflictions and his uh, being united and or your heart let's say your heart experiencing the the how your two hearts are united right in the context on the context of affliction that's a weird thing to happen it's a miracle so I don't know if that answers your question LA but um, absolutely thank you that's um brilliant Bradley I, I really really appreciate it thanks thank you why I know you've seen it and experienced it yourself. So that's a little different than, you know, a philosophical um, response to it. But, you you know, when we live it and then we testify to it. What I think is so wonderful and magnificent about it is, is it is has how our wounds become healing for another. That's just weird. And yet, um, oh, yeah, a reality. That, that is such uh, a huge reality. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to join with you permanently in this platform. Well, this is a weekend, <laughs> a weekend conference, but please, uh, yes, follow Father Leonard and I on, on if you have, can get to Facebook. Um, that's, that's where we can have an ongoing conversation. Yeah. Thank you. I think to add to that, one of the things that I've, I'm blessed with in, in the church is... Um, when we go through especially feast days especially the week leading up to holy pascha is we are present and experiencing in reality in real time in present tense the journey that jesus takes to the cross and we feel that as as we go through that time and that is that's not a theoretical thing you're present in the church hearing the gospel lessons hearing the the crying of of uh, those people who who were lamenting the death of Christ and it it's such a a deeply profoundly spiritual mystical experience there's there's there isn't an explanation for that um, it just it just is and and to have that experience is truly a great blessing. And uh, and I and I find that that that's one of the things that I truly appreciate about serving um, those services during Holy Week. There's a lot of them. We don't do all of them, but we do. You know, within twelve days, we do about thirteen or fourteen services that really focus on the upcoming part of who Christ is. Uh, Vladika Lazar probably serves about twenty during that same time. It's very, very rich, very thick with uh, with prayer and with um, just to such a blessing. Anyway, I hope I didn't ramble too much there, but I, I love what you said there, Brad. That's, that makes so much well, sense. Well, 
I mean, let's just review what you said yesterday, and that is that we speak of these things in the present tense. And and this is so um it's not that Christ died, it is that Christ is crucified. It's not that Christ rose, it's that Christ is risen, and that this the dying and the rising because we're it transcends time right so we're not we're, we're pulling ourselves off that temporal um you know the, far more than a memorial i'm stepping into sacred time where the this is a now moment for us you know is that am i saying it right father Leonard? yep absolutely absolutely uh, any other comments or questions? It, it's not like we have to go till the bitter end of the hour, but we do want to make space if, you know, yeah. conversation. I, Eric? I, I do have a question that's kind of bouncing around my head. Um, I think of uh, passages that we often turn to for comfort, um, you know, like in Romans 8, where, where Paul says, I consider that all of these earthly sufferings are are not worth considering compared to the glory about to be revealed uh, or revelation 21 where it, it talks about how you know when when jesus makes all things new uh you know there will be no more tears no no sorrow no suffering um but i'm also i'm really aware that that often those passages can kind of become conversation enders you know um and I guess I guess I'm just wondering, you know, how do we find the the right the right balance, um, you know? Because I mean, I think those things are intended to be a comfort to us, but you know, how do we how do we keep from crossing over into just saying, well, all all the affliction that you experience in this life just doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, man. Good question. Father Leonard, do you want to start with that one? Well, sure. Um, <laughs> I think one thing you touched on earlier is that that our suffering becomes a source of healing for everyone around us. And that is truly a gift that only only God can make available to us. Um, it's painful. It's hard. It is not fun. But that that's one of the things that I believe is it helps others around us. Uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarov had this saying that that uh, I repeat often. He said, "Acquire the spirit of peace, and thousands around you will be saved." And that spirit of peace means that you endure whatever it is that God is allowing to hit you. It, that's that's the way it goes. And as you endure that, and as you work with that, and as you um, are healed then others are healed around you. Um, Henry Nguyen has a beautiful example of the wounded healer. And it's a, it's a beautiful book that describes the process of what it takes to be a healer and, and to, be, to be wounded is a big part of that journey. And uh, anybody who's in 12 step can certainly, you know, confirm that. Um, you are with others who are hurting and you are hurting and you heal together. And God is with us. And God heals us. God forgives us. God saves us. Does that, does that fit in, Brad? Yeah, totally. I was thinking the same thing. It, but what I'm hearing, you know, if, I, if you read between the lines what Father Leonard's saying, and I think what the scriptures are saying, it's uh, that these are not platitudes that you impose on someone else, like to um, silence their lament. Yeah. Um, they're there these are testimonies of someone who suffered and and as as a way not to silence lament but to say i've lamented too i really i i've walked this path and then we uh in 12-step meetings we would say things like this um so we've come together to to share our st struggles and our suffering but also f for those to share our courage strength and hope and um as those who've walked that path. So, so for Paul to be able to say those things, he can say them from a prison as somebody who's been beaten <laughs> half to death. And, and so then they're a testimony, not a platitude. Yeah. And, 
one of the really wild things that I've noticed is when people first come to a 12 step meeting, they are um, some of the guys I know, you know, they can't even lift their head up. They, they're not ready for eye contact and they, and what, what happens is they come in the room and they hear people just like them who've come out of the same stories and they're smiling and they're like, you're smiling. How did you get to smiling? It's like, let me share. And um, that how, how I recovered joy and how I, how I've come to peace and it will. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just hyper aware of the problem that you're raising in terms of how that can be a platitude and requires sometimes knowing when to shut up and just be a presence. I'm thinking of a specific couple, dear friends of mine, where they lost their daughter. The mother experienced that loss as presence. She could feel the presence and peace and comfort of God all around her. And she could feel her daughter's presence in the cloud of witnesses. The dad, on the other hand, he he had to be honest. He said, I feel no comfort at this point. I'm trying. The Bible says I'm supposed to have comfort. I'm telling you, it's all absence. There's no comfort. And I thought this guy, he he did not believe he could ever have joy again. Uh, it just took him a lot longer. But I could see how the use of these passages as platitudes would, was spiritual abuse. Um, and what it required was wisdom around, and you know, it could have ended their marriage too, because they couldn't relate to each other at all in the grieving. Um, and yet they hung in there and they honored each other. So when she was joyful and would say, oh, a butterfly landed on the window today. And I just felt like it was my daughter, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't crush that. And then on the other hand, um, when she, when he would be expressing his lament about absence and grief and lack of comfort, um, um, she didn't impose her platitudes. They just, uh, what they did was how they did connect was being present to each other. And, um, and so I th that's how I'd respond, Derek. I think I, be hyper aware of that. That is such a beautiful beautiful story I, I think i'm going to steal that <laughs> it, it it's powerful that that's how people heal and and uh we just need to be with those who are going through that piece of hell there's i don't know it's not many polite words to use to describe that piece but especially a child oh powerful stuff and oftentimes losing a child ends a marriage often um, but, but I'm so glad to hear that, that your friends are sticking it out, are enduring whatever's going on and, and they're being with each other from exactly where they're at. That's, that's just, that's fantastic. Thanks. That's a great story. Thanks. Thank you. Was there any any other last question? Um, someone was asking about about um, this reading more on Simone Weil. So I translated two of her books and compiled it into one book. And it's on Amazon called "Awaiting God." So if you go a uh, Weil, Jersak, and "Awaiting God," you'll find it. In there, there's a powerful chapter that she. This is all her writings. Powerful chapter called. Uh, something like the love of God and affl or affliction and the love of God or love of God and affliction. And it's uh, that's where I was drawing a lot of this from. And so I, I actually translated the book for the purpose of answering that question. Where do I start with Simone Weil? This is where you would start. Um, uh, if there's those who would, who would love to, uh, you know, check in with, with Jewel and connecting with him by WhatsApp. I know he would, he would love your encouragement. He's got a number there. Um, so we're coming back in how long? Uh, two hours. In two hours. Good. And there was also a question about, will the slides be made available? Yes, we can do that. Yep. Good stuff. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's uh, end for now, and we'll carry on in two hours. Thanks, everyone, for your for your time and for your participation. It's it's such a, a joy and a pleasure to be with you. And any of you who want you can, uh, uh, Jewel, but anybody else, uh, there's my email, bradjersack at gmail .com. Feel free to send messages, and and uh, and we'll see you in two hours. Got it. God bless. Okay. Ciao.